an undisclosed location somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, waiting out the alien apocalypse. He is armed with a machete and a microphone. This is the Alien Outpost. Are you ready? Welcome, Grant Cameron. I'm telling you, this is, I say this a lot, especially with people that I really like. I feel like a fat kid in the candy store. <laughs> so last year at the 2017, I believe it was the 30th annual Ozark UFO conference, I first interviewed you on video. And that was a, got a lot of feedback from that interview. Great uh, interview. We talked about many things, disclosure and the portal. We're going to talk about many things also. I do want to talk about the portal thing that's going on in the Zendras because that's very fascinating. A lot of the people that follow my channel on YouTube Good. had they, that was some of the biggest feedback in the comments was about the portals. So thank you for spending your time with me, Grant. Well, thanks, Michael, for having me on. I appreciate your interest in what I'm doing. So let's go ahead and go to Tom DeLong. Okay. Uh, what's the latest word on Tom DeLong? Is there anything new that has come to the surface? Um, Tom DeLong. Um, basically what I'm chasing is there's four parts to his program. The way I look at it, they have, um, medals, they have the videos, they have reports. And the fourth part is the experiencer part of the story that I say is the most important part. They're working with experiencers. Tom DeLong really doesn't have that much to do with the research that they're doing. Tom DeLong, people have to keep in mind, he's a media guy. He has a media company. Um, he's just basically interested in uh, putting out movies, getting stories, telling stories, putting out toys, and he wants a trilogy. He wants to sort of control the UFO story and tell it like the, the new Steven Spielberg type thing. Mm -hmm. So that's his role. He is coming out, though people don't know, he is doing a uh, presentation with Lou Elizondo in Brazil in May. Most people don't know that. So they're bringing him back out. They, he sort of disappeared from the scene after the Joe Rogan interview. A lot of people said that he messed up the Joe Rogan interview. I, I watched I, that. It, I, it was. It almost seemed like he was getting blasted by Joe Rogan. Well, yeah, it was Joe Rogan. But if you listen to what Tom DeLong said, I mean, he was saying some stuff when I reviewed the the interview for the second time. I went, "Whoa!" He was saying some stuff that was pretty significant. Like, for example, a lot of people miss stuff in the interviews because most people. It's not a mistake, but people watch an interview one time. And then they just go on to the next interview, the next video, the next interview, the next video, the next story, and it's like 24-hour news. And they never pick up on what's actually going on. So if you go back and listen to interviews, that's what I'll do. I'll review Tom DeLonge's interviews. I'll listen to them six times. I'll go back to, I've got a guy who can provide me any interview I want. So I'll go back to 2016 when he did the interviews with George Knapp. And you'll hear stuff that you never heard before. So on the Joe Rogan interview, for example, he states that... Um, when he released the book um, uh, Secret, Secret Machines Chasing Shadows, that was released April the 5th, 2016. He said that he was contacted by U.S. intelligence. So if you put that together with the fact that Jim Semivan contacted him in April of 2016, he was contacted by Jim Semivan. And Jim Semivan basically said, what are you doing? Who are you talking to? But if you listen to the Joe Rogan interview and you hear Tom DeLonge, he said when he was contacted by U.S. intelligence, he was he was taken to a uh, hotel room in San Diego and he was grilled for two days. He was sort of debriefed for two days by six intelligence agents. Mm. So that was something new when I went, whoa, six intelligence. This was uh, like a huge uh, interest by the government. And not just, you know, some former CIA guy coming and talking to him. So basically you had this thing and basically he said at that point, they, he said, they said, who are you talking to? You know stuff you shouldn't know. And he mentioned the generals and Robert Weiss from Lockheed and they sort of were sort of blown away by who he was talking to. 
And they said, well, they were willing to help him, but you shouldn't talk about this. You shouldn't talk about that. So that's when he said in the Joe Rogan interview, he said, well, you have to go back and listen to those interviews to see what I was talking about. So there's a bunch of stuff in those early interviews that Tom DeLonge was talking about that he's no longer talking about, which would indicate it's true stuff. It's something that, that sort of he went over the line. Are they silencing him? Forces, yeah, they just said saying some of the things. Yeah, they were just saying you shouldn't talk about these things anymore. So now I'm going back and reviewing as many early interviews or the interviews he did with Rolling Stone and stuff like that to see what was he talking about that's not being talked about now. So that's the thing. I, I sort of follow that kind of stuff. But so they pulled Tom DeLong af, off after the Rogan show, and um, he everybody said it was because he messed up the Rogan show. But I don't think it was that. What I was told. Uh, a year before anything's happened, I may have mentioned this last year, was that I was told that high-level government officials would come forward, they would out themselves, and they would say this thing's for real. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. So they moved it away from Tom DeLong to these high-level officials, Lou Elizondo, uh, Jim Semivan, uh, Steve Justice, Chris Mellon, all these high-level guys, and they come out. And, bef and when they told me that a year before, that was something that nobody ever would have believed, that high-level government officials are going to come out and say, I'm a high-level government official and we're studying UFOs. I, I, there's no way I believe that. And that's exactly what happened. And so what happened in December of last year, this was not disclosure. This was confirmation. And again, you got to go back to interviews. So there was an interview that Bob Bigelow did in 2013 with George Norrie. In that interview, George Norrie starts and he says, I think something's going on. I think the government, you know, some, there's some sort of deal going on that they want to leak stuff out. The guy that would know is Bob Bigelow. And he said to Bob, his first question is, are you in favor of disclosure? And Bob Bigelow, who now controls most of the UFO information, said, no, I'm not in favor of disclosure. I'm in favor of confirmation. Mm -hmm. And he said, what you need to do, what we need to do, and this is 2013, he said, what we need to do is we need to get the idea across to the American public that UFOs are real and it's a mystery and we're studying it. And you stop right there. That's exactly what they did on December 16th. But out the videos, New York Times, they said we're studying the UFO program. They We're not saying it's alien. We're not saying it's extraterrestrial. So they stopped right there. Just say UFOs are real. The government is studying it. And then in the 2013 interview, that's when Bigelow said, disclosure will take place a couple of years down the road. Then you can tell them what's actually going on. But you got to start simple. UFOs are real. This is what they should have done in 1947. Mm -hmm. UFOs are real. We don't know what's going on. And that's the story they put out. So this is what happened last December was confirmation. It was not disclosure. And I don't want to get on to 1947, but, well, but briefly, what, what really boggles my mind is shouldn't, the National Security Act of 1947, what they believe is in September, mm -hmm. shouldn't that like be a staple in people's minds to let them realize that there is something going on? Because what happened two months before that? Yeah, Roswell. Well, I think it, I think it even goes back farther than the National Security Act. I think people, when they look at what's going on here, is the fact they got to realize that this is military and the U.S. United States government has a $675 million defense budget bigger than all the defense budgets in the world. The United States of America is a major arms place. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's half, you know, whatever it is, 15% of the economy is the military. And, and it's something you can't really shut down. And so when you see what happened, how this whole thing developed, this whole security thing developed, it actually started to develop in World War II with the atomic bomb, where they compartmentalized all the information that you had 50,000 people or whatever it was working on the atomic bomb and nobody knew what anybody was doing and they built this thing in total secrecy with all these people working and they also developed the homing torpedo and they developed this proximity fuse and jet, jet engines and plastic explosives and all the rest of this stuff during World War II and it worked and so they developed a system of, of compartmentalization that the military is running the show the military gets it so in the prime example is GPS GPS was a military technology. So they run it, they, they develop it, and then they spin it into the, into the, 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 the public uh, world. But the military will have everything first. So when you see what's going on now, whether it's the consciousness technology, whether it's the UFO technology, it is going to be militarized. Absolutely. The only people that have any money for research that run the labs is the military. And that's why with the, the ATIP program called, it was called a threat program. 
you would not have gotten any money. You can't go to the Defense Department and say, oh, we think UFOs are interesting. Uh, we'd like to study UFOs. They'll say, get out of here. You're crazy. But if you say this may be the Russians, this may be the Chinese, this may be Al-Qaeda, this may be aliens coming to eat us, then you're talking to the Defense Department and that's their job is defense of the American people. Then you can get the money. So it will, it will absolutely be militarized. What they're doing is because you have to spin it with this evil uh, intention thing that this could be a threat. Otherwise, you're not going to get the money. And the ATIP program had $22 million. But most people know that if they're doing back engineering on crash flying saucers and stuff, it's probably going to be trillions of dollars that have to go into this. The only people who have got the money and are the military. And so you have to have this threat thing. So what they'll do is they'll take all the technology and some people say that from Rendlesham Forest, they've already got a weapon built from what they learned at Rendlesham Forest. The consciousness technology uh, mm -hmm. in terms of flying planes, because I've got, I do a lot of interviews with people who have flown the craft and stuff like that. And they all say you fly it with your mind. And now you see the technology is already there with the F-35 where they're basically this thing where you're tapped into this computer with your mind and you can sort of just think what you want to do. You don't need the steering wheel, all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And so that's what it, the way it works is the military will use all what they're learning with the UFOs, consciousness, all that sort of stuff. You use as many military things or defenses against military programs that the Russians may have with this technology. And then they will spin it into the, into the public. But first it's going to be militarized. And that's why they've moved it into the Bigelow airspace is because they're trying to move it away from the government. So you, you don't want FOIAs. Plus, you want the disclosure to take place outside the government. So what you do is you move it to Bigelow Aerospace. Bigelow Aerospace has the videos, the, the photographs, all sorts of stuff. And then you give it to Tom DeLong and his group. They make the disclosure announcement with gov former government officials. And the government's off the hook as to having to say, uh, we were doing it. And that's what's happened. So they've said, the government is releasing these videos, which is not really true. And uh, the ATA program exists, which the government, if you ask them, they'll say, we have no records of any ATIP program. And they've bought into this thing where people are now believing that the government is running this thing. And uh, and yet it's not true. But it's you got to remember, it's that military aspect to this whole thing. These are the guys with the money and the power who are able to actually research this thing. The UFO community has got no money. Nobody, the public doesn't care. You have to spin it as a threat, develop the technology, and then move it into the public. With a lot of this technology, because um, Roswell was post World War Two, yeah. So, but during World War Two, there was a, an advancement in, in technology, and it makes you wonder. I forgot the uh, what was the the crash believed to be in Missouri in Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know which one. Yeah, yeah. Do you believe that maybe the advancements that helped us win the war possibly came from that type of technology that was in Missouri? Missouri. I believe it was 41 or other types of crash retrieval, uh, I guess, things that happened within the military. Um, actually, yeah, if I think about it, I don't think there I mean, was an advancement, you know, big time. Yeah. You know. But everybody sort of assumes that we've got it. If you take a look at, for example, I'll give you an example. The, um, the Tom DeLong, they talk about this piece, this 37 layer piece of material that, that Linda Howe talks about quite a bit that she was working with. And she's working with Hal Putoff on this, and he's giving her ideas. Um, they state that there's no way we, we could not develop this stuff now. It's this, you know, very, very pure 99.9% .9 aluminum. The bismuth is pure. It's layered, you know, one to four microns. And, and as Tom DeLong says it's layered atomically, one atom at a time, and, and in lines and stuff, all structured as if they're putting it down one atom at a time. That kind of stuff we don't have. And so when you hear that, you it almost indicates that we don't have the secret space program. We don't have any of this stuff. And so I asked, like, for example, Chris Bledsoe, who was inside a lot of these programs mm -hmm. or had access to a lot of this information. I said to him, can you can you ask, do we have a secret space program? Because this is a big controversy. And he said he asked and, he, and they said, we have advanced technology. We do not have that. So there's this debate. Do we develop all this sort of stuff? Is this our stuff that's flying around? And do we have all this kind of stuff? Or are we, we've got a little bits and pieces. What I've seen from what I've got is that, um, for example, Jim Semivan was asked, um, who's running this program? Or who's running the thing? Who's, who's in charge here? And he said, they are. 
which sort of indicated that we really don't know very much of anything. The beings, whoever this mm -hmm. intelligence is, is basically running the program. So they may have developed little bits and pieces. Like there was the idea, Corso brought out the idea that they had um, night vision was leaked and fiber, fiber optics. optics and stuff like that. And there are some stories, there's even a recent one that, that this Desta, um, you should maybe interview her. Um, she was actually just in a, a crash that occurred in 1945. She was down there and she did some, some videotaping of the, the witness and she talked about, there's a piece that they had that I had actually handled last, last year or two years ago that was hidden away and they had actually done an analysis on this and it had this sort of fiber optic inside this piece and they had this, the analysis of this, of this piece. And so the fiber optic may be a key part, but whether we've got the technology to sort of back engineer all the thing, or we may have a situation where in the black world, they back engineered all this stuff, but you can't, you have to find a way to get it in the white world. You cannot release the black world technology because it's so highly classified. And that may be why they're doing this thing where they set up Bigelow Aerospace. They leak little bits and pieces of the story to help industry. We've got this layered material. It's got these characteristics or whatever, but they don't, they hold back the piece of material so that industry starts to work on this stuff in the white world because they can't move the black world stuff into the white world. So it's, it's a very complex situation as to exactly uh, what's going on, but it, it does more and more confirm that the military has always been very interested in this kind of material and that's coming not from whistleblowers and stuff, but from people, high level government officials who are basically confirming, yeah, we've had a program, we're running this thing. And, and before we get into that, do you think that's the reason why Eisenhower made his speech? About, you know, I have a different, my, I, and I'm the presidential guy. I say that everybody got that speech completely messed up. What what he warned about is exactly what's happening right now. Six hundred seventy five billion dollar budget that you cannot stop. It just keeps growing. Uh, there's more threats. Everybody's an enemy of the United States mm -hmm. of America. And you got to realize if you get outside the United States of America, if you, I live in Canada, I mean we don't think about invading a country or doing anything like that. This is a deal. So what he said in that speech, because I went to the Eisenhower Library and I looked at the speech. And what happened at the Eisenhower Library is I'm there for five days and within two hours I've seen all the UFO documents because there basically are no UFO documents. And then it's like, well, what am I going to do for the rest of the week? So I would read what are called oral histories. So if you're the cook at the, at the White House, when you re resign or quit or whatever, they say, oh, can we do an oral history with you? And so you sit down for an interview and they say, what was it like to be the cook? Did the president ever come at three o'clock in the morning and steal stuff out of the fridge? And, you know, what does the president like yeah. to eat? And they go through this whole thing. So they did a bunch of oral histories in all the presidential libraries. They've got these oral histories. And you people. read a lot of things. And I read it. That's what I did for the whole week. I'd sit there and read these oral histories because nothing else to do. And so I, they had them by index. So I looked up the military industrial speech and there were six people in their, in their, in their oral histories that talked about it. And they all said the same thing. It wasn't the military industrial complex. It was the military industrial congressional com complex. What it was, and this is what he was warning about, was that the military gets, if you're a senator, I get you, you back the program, you got a, a, a factory in your state that has 10,000 uh, people building whatever, like tanks is the prime example. They're building tanks, and then when you try to shut it down, the Congress stops it because, no, you're not going to shut down this 10,000 uh, program in my district because I'm I'm this sort of, uh, you know, big congressman, and they can block it. So it was this cycle that congressmen are feeding this the thing. They need the jobs. The military needs the congressman to vote this thing. So it's, it's, it's this vicious circle that goes round and around, and you can't shut it down. And the prime example was the Abrams tank. Mm -hmm. At one, because the... In, military has gotten to the point where it's an air war. So you don't need tanks anymore. It's totally useless. So the, the army put out the, the, the request, we don't want any more Abrams tanks. And there actually was an article written about it. It was called Tanks But No Thanks. And, and they couldn't shut it down because it was these congressional people, there were so many jobs at stake that you couldn't shut the program down. So they continued to build tanks, even though the army didn't want any more tanks. They said, stop the tanks. We don't need tanks, but you can't stop it. And that was what he was talking about, was this vicious circle where once the thing gets going, the budget gets bigger and bigger, and there's more congressmen have more jobs at stake, and you just can't shut it down. So I don't think it really had anything to do with UFOs. That's that's my, my impression based upon my research at the Eisenhower Library. All right, Grant. Uh, back to Tom DeLong. Mm -hmm. Um now, before we get to the, the UFO portal and everything, um, because I know you got a little bit more information than you 
did last year. Who who are all the players and who is feeding Tom DeLong? Because he is being used, I would say, in, in good terms, he in, in, in all goodness to the UFO community, but he's being led, being used to, sp to leak this information. Now, who are these? I know maybe ask, asking you to speculate some, but who are these players? Well, a lot of them are known. Um, he had... Um, are they deep within the government? Oh, yeah. The, the first guy he had was... Um, it may have been Steve Justice. It was somebody below... Um, in in the um, uh, Lockheed, he gets an invitation to go to a barbecue at Lockheed. They know he's into the subject. He says to the guy, and the guy says, "Be careful who you talk to," and this sort of stuff. And then he says he gets invited to Lockheed, and they say we're having this party in the parking lot. People can't go in, but if you want to come and introduce the president, you know, you might get an idea of what we're doing which you wouldn't get from some barbecue in the thing. So he said, okay, if I can talk to the president for five minutes after, I'll come. So he goes uh, to this thing. He introduces the president, and then he sits down with the president. He said, I've got this, I got this idea. And he doesn't mention UFOs or anything. i got this idea. But, of course, they know he's into UFOs. And the guy says, yeah, okay, sure, come on up. And they bring him up to Area 51. So he meets with Robert Weiss, with the head scientist at Lockheed Skunk Works, and probably with Steve Justice. And they're in a skiff and a secure facility, and they're talking about all this sort of stuff. And he he gives him his spiel about what he wants to do. He wants to have this you know thing for the young people. You guys can't get the message across, which is true. The government can't. They need someone to put the message out. Mm -hmm. So Tom DeLong fit their, their profile. He was young people and stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, he they they say, well, this could actually work. At one point, the one guy says, this could actually work. So um, he gives him his spiel about the evil aliens and his idea of how, how the, uh, this is working. And at that point, they say to him, we've got someone we want you to meet. So he gets this email, and it says, meet outside the Pentagon on a certain day and a certain time. And then he meets with two intelligence guys. So these are the, the, you have the Lockheed guys. Then you have these two intelligence guys, and that, they're the guys that say things like that, things like this do not happen at the White House, do not happen in Congress. They happen with a couple of guys like us meet together and decide to move the football down the field. And then they send him to, to, to uh, NASA. And he goes there, and it's there he meets with some high-level person there. I have, I have a source there, but I'm not sure whether he, – I know he talked to Tom Long, but I'm not sure he was the, the high-level guy that he talked to. Yeah. Then he was sent to Ames Air Force uh, – Ames, Ames uh, on, the, on the West Coast. And that's when he meets uh, – he gets sent to the general. He gets sent to Robert uh, um, McCaslin, General McCaslin, who used to run the lab at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where it's rumored that the Roswell material was. Mm -hmm. So this Neil McCaslin guy meets with him for two hours, and he basically uh, says, "We found a life form during the Civil War, or during the war, the Cold War. We th we we were always aware that we might the world might be destroyed at any time with nuclear weapons, and during that time, we found a, a life a, a life form." And then he sends them to uh, McKay at um, at uh, Space Command, and there's a we don't know who it is, but there's a um, a, um, a colonel there. And then he has I know he has a, a high level uh, general inside the National Reconnaissance Organization, so they set him up. And then, as I mentioned before, in April of 2016, Jim Semivan links up with him and these six intelligence agents. Yeah. So basically, you have this team forming. And what I'm told is there are 40 plus people that are involved. Now, some of them are not directly involved. So you'll have Jacques Vallée indirectly involved, John Alexander, uh, all these uh, various players. There's uh, Dan Pasolka. It's sort of on the outside. They're sort of like maybe taking questions or interested or whatever, but they're not really part of it. But he's try I think what Tom DeLong has tried to do is he's tried to interact with all the UFO community to try to drag these people in to use them. And the one example was... They contacted the Free Foundation, which has the 4,000 experiencers, and they offered, Tom DeLong offered them that we are willing to bring you on as the abduction research arm up to the STARS Academy, and we'll pay the salaries of all the people. And then Ray told him it's a non-profit thing. Nobody's really getting paid. It's all volunteer type stuff, and we aren't releasing the records. They're all confidential. And so that thing sort of dropped off. But that's the kind of stuff where they would 
drag people into this thing to advise and then they sort of enter into this what they call the cosmic club where they're all off the record they're, and so you'll have academics in there who are sort of interested in their talking but they don't want their identities released so there are from what semi van said and from what i also hold about heard about this cosmic club there's better than 40 people that are involved now with this uh the tooth of stars academy now who is all help funding that and is, do you think it's possible that it could be Cointel Pro? Well, uh, that's speculation. The, the, what I know for sure is that they raised the two and a half million dollars through this uh, this sort of com special company. This you know that they set up that it was announced in the October 11th thing. So they got that two and a half million dollars. And then I know what Jim Semivan stated was that there's uh, this second group, and it's it's a uh, it's linked to two the stars but it's not part of two the stars and this is the one that's working with the experiencers this involves um help put off kit green and gary nolan from stanford university these three phd guys mm -hmm. who are working with the experiencers trying to develop you know what's unique about an experiencer and highly psychic people now what they state and there's a tape i'll play tomorrow morning where kit green actually talks about i'm interested in the MRI. I'm interested in the brain patterns. My sponsor is interested in the rest of it. And he goes into this kind of stuff. So there's a sponsor and John Alexander in during one interview actually talks about a sponsor as well. So they've got some money that finances this, this sort of experiencer thing. Now, whether it's coming from Bigelow, whether it's coming from CIA, it's, it's speculation, mm -hmm. but I do know they, two of them refer to as sponsors. So, um, there is, there is money, um, for this kind of stuff, because to the star, when when to the stars went to free, they were offering to pay all these these uh, these salaries. So there is some money around. Now, what was your initial reaction to the the Pentagon UFO program and the UFO that was released in the video? And um, I guess since then, what have you? learned about the program and maybe possibly the UFO footage? Um, I, in my book, Managing Magic, which was written before that, mm -hmm. that whole thing happened, I, I basically said that they said this was going to happen. So I wasn't you surprised. Told me last year. It yeah, was it, it, it didn't surprise me when it happened. Um, the way they're rolling it out is a little bit different, a little bit slower than I thought they would do it. But um, it, it's... Um, it's, it's a program where it was predicted most of the time what I've spent after is um, the videos. I, I spent some time working the videos and there's some problem with the videos because there's the problem that the New York Times said that they were approved by the Defense Department. And when you look at the FOA material, which I've tried to work, watch people working on the FOA stuff, the Defense Department is saying we did not release any videos. Uh, we don't have any record on any ATIP program. And so what you had is a situation where the New York Times and the uh, Washington Post got confirmations off the record inside the Pentagon that this is for real. They ran with the story. They would not have run with the story unless they had like two independent sources inside the Pentagon who said, yeah, this is for real. But when you try to confirm it, you don't get anything. And so I've spent time on and the videos. Uh, so the, the idea is where do these videos come from? How did they get them into the public? And the, the more important thing, what I've worked on is this whole thing with the experiencer thing. What are they doing with experiencers? Uh, how does this work? Uh, and, and this kind of stuff, which I think is the sort of the critical element because it gets into the consciousness thing. It gets into mm -hmm. uh, people who are very sort of psychic. And so you heard these experiments about them uh, putting two experiencers in MRI machines and trying to see if they can send a signal uh, non-locally where there's no time delay between these two MRI machines or uh, getting an experiencer who's actually set up to bring in the in the in the entity can you bring them in this kind of stuff so you hear these like leading edge type things that they're mm -hmm. working on very quietly in the background because these are high level scientists who can you know lose their security clearances can be written off as total wackos and so they're keeping some of this stuff secret and that's the part that interests me is is the experiences because i say you can look at the videos for the next 70 years you're never going to learn anything no. you just you're just going to say looks interesting we didn't build it and mm -hmm. or the the reports are mostly reports on you know 
theories of interdimensional travel or you know or you know going between stars and stuff and the metal stuff even if you got the metal stuff you're looking at it and what i heard is like we can't produce this stuff it's very strange metal but it really doesn't tell you how flying saucer flies or where they're from or that sort of stuff it's not until you talk to the experiencers who are interacting with the phenomena and are being given answers and and are being able to ask questions that you actually know what's going on so that's the part of the thing that i've spent most of my time and then when you brought up the portal the portal is a separate issue because you have the tom de operation and then you have the second operation which i was following which was the, the the cia operation this is dr ron pendolfi who for the last two years through a spokesman dan smith this is the plausible deniability everything dan smith says ron will say never told him that Never. He made it up. So Dan Smith puts this stuff out. Dan Smith is a guy who's into eschatology and into religion and stuff. And everybody goes, I don't listen to Dan Smith. Forget Dan Smith. So that's the way it works. So Dan Smith puts this, has been putting up for the last two years, based upon what he's been told by Ron, is this idea that there's a portal and that they're working on this portal technology, which interested me because I'm interested in the consciousness aspect of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. If portals are real, and you can walk through a portal and be in another world on another planet instantaneously, then the material paradigm of the universe is in serious trouble. Mm. And that's what's holding us back. It's the idea that we believe that the universe is made out of little nuts and bolts and their consciousness is an illusion and it's a random world and all this kind of nonsense. That's where that's holding us back. That's why people say there can't be any UFOs, there can't be any ETs because you can't get here from there. The distances are too big, and that's all based on this materialistic paradigm. Once you have portals, the materialistic paradigm game is changer. gone. It's a game changer. It's like, wow, it's like, what is going on here? How does the world really work? And that's what we have to do, is if ETs, and uh, or whatever they are, if somebody's visiting this planet, we've got something wrong. Something we believe is wrong, and you've got to redo all of reality. You've got to re in, re-examine the whole thing and find out how does the world really work and that's where I come down to say that it's consciousness based it's not material based consciousness creates reality and quantum physics is starting to hint that's the the thing and that's why the portal is so important so you have the second team and I watch them and because it's all this plausible deniability and Ron can't go on the record and they're doing rhymes and riddles and all this nonsense it, at times you sort of give up on it and say, well, this thing ain't going anywhere or whatever, but I always watch what they do. And that's the way I play the game is I say, you're in trouble. The minute you say this guy's right or that guy's wrong, the minute you say this guy's right, you join his church and suddenly you stop thinking. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I have a hundred people on a list and I watch what everybody says and I try not to come to a conclusion that this guy, you never know who's going to be right. So I've always kept Ron and Kevin Albers, the other guy on the team, and uh, Jack Sarfati and Dan Smith and all these people on that other side and watched what they said. And they kept talking about this portal thing, even though they couldn't produce a portal and stuff. And then what happened was this happened Tuesday night. It started about two weeks ago where uh, I'd heard about um, the fact that Joe Firmage, who's a big dot-com executive from the 1990s, um, had had an experience and if you go to Joe Firmage's YouTube site you'll see him talk about this experience where this being comes into the room and they're talking about space travel and why should we help you with space travel or something that they, this being says to him it's a human type being and he says because I'm willing to die for it mm -hmm. and he basically quits this CEO of this huge company uh, air, uh, computer company and he starts the UFO thing and he starts to build technology and he's trying to build a portal technology to this other world and he believes this kind of stuff. He believes he's been given this material. He starts to develop this equipment. And he has what's called the bouncing box. This is what Ron Pandolfi calls this thing. And it's, it's on, you can see it. There's actually a demo of this thing on his YouTube website. And it's a box and it has these sort of gyros spinning in different directions on this thing. And they're going faster and faster and faster. Mm -hmm. And the box starts to bounce. And the box is sort of lift, lifting off the ground. So people said it was an anti-gravity device. And, but we always heard that Firmage, this was a portal type device. Yeah. Then I heard a couple weeks ago that they had actually perfected this thing. That a guy by the name of Dan Merrick, who, Merritt, who was a, a former U.S. congressman from the state of Utah, had been involved. He put in $4 million. And I'd heard before that that, that um, there had been $90 million. That Firmage had put $90 million into this. Wow. And that they had perfected this thing. And that they'd come for a company 
Dan Merritt was one, Joe Firmage, and this Kevin Alver guy who sort of works for Ron mm -hmm. Dolphy. They formed this company, and there was going to be a demonstration. This would be a week ago Friday. They were going to have the demonstration, and we heard that it, it, it was going to happen the Friday. Really didn't hear anything. And then suddenly, Wednesday of this week, so we're in April of 2018, we're... Um, we're on the, the Saturday, this happened on the, the Tuesday night. So on Wednesday, suddenly Dan Smith starts to phone. And because I'm in the United States, my phone is roaming, so we don't really touch our phones. And I could see his phone calls coming in. And basically he's saying, I need to talk to you. Why aren't you answering your phone? Something's happening in Salt Lake City. And that's where Joe Firmage has this machine. Joe Firmage lives in Salt Lake City. Something's happened. There's been a, there's, there's been a development. And so what happened was, and I just had a phone call before this interview started, to Washington to try to gather as, as much material as I can for tomorrow's lecture and said, what's the deal? So what happened Tuesday night? And it was like, you know, the ifs and buts and all this sort of stuff bouncing around or whatever. And basically what it came down to is that the machine was running. Kevin Alver was there. He was filming and a portal type thing opened up and a bean came out of the portal or wow. it came, came out, or it was near the machine. There was a being, it was a blue being, it was near the machine, and the being, so I asked Dan this morning, I said, there was a, he said there was a telepathic message. And I said, well, what was the message? And he said, well, it was kind of like, oh, hi there, can we help you? And so then that video was sent to Ron Pandolfi. So I said to Dan Smith, I said, so what did Ron say? was Ron impressed? Well, yeah, he was, he was impressed. And then I said, okay, so I'm going to go lecture tomorrow in front of whatever, five, seven, a hundred, eight hundred people. What's the message? And, and then he said, well, the message is, uh, we see you, you see us. And I'm going, oh, okay. And then I said, um, um, everybody's going to ask, you know what they're going to ask. They're going to ask, so where's the video? And well, and I said, they're going to say, why aren't you releasing the video? And then he said, well, uh, that would probably confuse, confuse things. And I said, okay, so what's your message to the people? Like, this is your chance. This has happened or whatever. And it sort of bounced around like that. It really didn't go anywhere that, yeah, the film was there. And then he even said that Firmage didn't know. And it's like, Come on. I mean, he, he was, he's his machine. He didn't know that a being appeared beside the machine. And that um, they're going to, the last thing I heard was that they were supposed to be in Colorado this week. This is what I heard. This machine was going to Colorado. And they got people flying in from around the world. The Mormon church is sort of involved. And, and they're going to go to, um, to Colorado. I said, well, I thought that was last week. He said, no, it's next week. And then I, because I, I'd heard this, I said, so you're going? Uh, yeah, I'm going. And I said, well, Ron and Leah, yeah, they're going. And, and I said, he said, well, I don't know who's going to show up. And, and I really don't know if Joe's going to be there or whether they're going to demonstrate the thing or what's going to happen. So that's a development. It's a major development on the portal. And we, we even, one of the girls here this morning had actually talked to JJ Hertak, who's like a major figure in the UFO community who had this download experience in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. He knows Joe Firmage, and she asked him, does Joe Firmage have a portal? And he said, yes, he does. The same as I talked to Kevin Elber. And I didn't believe the portal. When it first came out, I thought it was like Star Trek nonsense. You know, like, don't give me that nonsense. Like, you know, it's like, I was still in the nuts and bolts world. And uh, so I asked Kevin, and I said, well, what's nonsense about the portal? He said, oh, no, that's true. And I said, why? You mean that that's part of the story is true? He said, oh, yeah, that's true. And I said, and he said, I've even been through one. I went, you've been through a portal? And he, he sort of described it. It, was, it seemed like it was a natural portal rather than a, a development portal. But the one that Firmage has is technology portal. And that he had actually, um, there had been a statement that Firmage had sort of perfected this, or he had worked on this portal, and that Ron Pandolfi had said to Kevin Albert, if you go to Firmage, he's going to want you to go through his portal. Don't go through, you may not come back. So this story, this is a story I've been chasing for two years, but the thing is to try to nail it down. Like, where's the video? Where's the actual thing? That's the way the CIA or almost... Keeping it hush-hush. Kind of yeah, like it's that. sort of like you release it, but you don't release it. You, it's mm -hmm. the idea. Tom DeLong talked about this. Tom DeLong says there's an actual operation, and that's what I put in Managing Magic. That's what the whole book. The whole book is about this, that you take the information, you put this information around, you throw it out, it bounces around, you and I argue about what's going on, and the story gets out, 
and nobody knows what the hell to believe. Who, which guy's telling the truth? Mm -hmm. This guy's telling one story. This guy's telling another story. And so you get to learn. There's a the live alien. There's stuff at Area 51. Uh, there's a portal. But nobody can actually nail it down because once you nail it down, you go from confirmation to disclosure and you lose control of the story. Then suddenly it starts to spiral out of control and you, you have no idea where it's going to go. This way, you pull it out, you pull it back. You put it out, you pull it back. And you keep gr control. gradually con keep the story going, but control the story. That's the key that they need to do because they're afraid of the thing getting out of control. And then you're saying, well, what about cattle relations? About they're eating us on the backside of the moon and all this stuff comes out and they're not prepared. They don't have the answers to a lot of the questions. So they, they want this slow release of information, which was started by the Brookings Institute, 1960 report, where they said the threat of extraterrestrial life is the knowledge that the lower society will disappear and that you've got to gradually acclimatize people to the fact that we are not alone in the universe. I agree. And thank you very much, Grant. That was a very fascinating discussion with you. And I will have you on the near future on my podcast again to get more in depth with some of these other topics. And maybe you, you will have more information, even more about the, the portal subject. But thank you very much. Thank Grant. you, Mike. Pleasure. Pleasure.